Good morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time of day it is where you're at. Welcome to Collider Dailies. I'm John Alditz, and I forgot to do this. Uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta change my light color. Uh, Maggie, okay. how are you doing? I'm here with Maggie. Yeah, I was like, wow, thanks for like not introducing me because your lights were more important. <sighs> yes, they, they're very important. It's, it, I'm setting a vibe. Oh yes, <laughs> it's a vibe, all right. <laughs> you've got, you got your cool background. I've got lights and nerd crap like we each do what we do how are you doing maggie I other than am... horribly insulted <laughs> i am horribly insulted but uh i'm doing great on this fine wonderful x-men 97 wednesday i woke up at 3 a.m to watch the episode because i have brain rot uh, <laughs> so i'm doing great uh surprisingly rolled back over went back to sleep got the rest of my night's sleep so i'm actually doing quite well yeah, yesterday while I was sitting there watching the episode, I actually did think to myself, I wonder if Maggie like stayed up or woke up to watch this at three or if she's going to wait until she wakes up in the morning and watch Maggie, it before the show. Maggie watched it. Um, now I'm talking like Remy, Maggie, uh, talking in third person. Maggie woke up at 3 a.m. and watched it and then watched it again at about 8.30. So she watched it twice today. I only have the one watch under my belt, but you know. Get on my level. We're still going to be talking about it at the end of the show. So if you have not seen X-Men 97, we are going to get into spoiler territory later on. But before we get into that, we have a couple of topics to talk about today. We're going to talk about more John Bernthal Punisher pictures. I'm feeling like deja vu. We just did this the other day. Uh, and uh, before that, we're going to be talking about Sam Raimi uh, was apparently asked if he would be interested in returning to a Marvel project. And... Uh, he he was totally on board with it. Uh, Screen Geek met up with Raimi at WonderCon this last weekend and asked him the question if he would be interested in it and possibly a uh, future Avengers film like Secret Wars. And he said, quote, I love 90% of the Marvel heroes that I've read in the great Stan Lee Marvel Universe comic books. I would love to work with Marvel again. They haven't reasonably asked me to. I hope they had a good experience with me. They haven't asked me yet. I hope they do. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. That like when I read that quote, I was like, I I completely hear Sam Raimi speaking like that. It's very, very Raimi in the way that he delivers things, very kind of obtuse and yeah. roundabout. Uh, but here's the thing. So Raimi directed Multiverse of Madness, and we actually we briefly we touched on Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, we <laughs> just talked about this. But one thing that we didn't talk about when it came to multiverse of madness because we we ex expressed our our individual opinions on it was our thoughts on his directing of the film how did you feel about how he directed multiverse of madness before we get into any future possibilities i tend to give the benefit of the doubt to like 90 percent of marvel directors because i know there is a lot of studio interference and in their own creative visions you see that happen with films like eternals there's definitely been some of those situations with some of the television shows so i do often try to give like the benefit of the doubt however in sam's situation i would say a lot of the things that i disliked the most in multiverse of madness were things that are very much in line with his creative visions and i i don't have any like like known dislike for sam raimi's like projects that he's worked on i like the spider-man stuff uh i just found that tonally speaking a lot of those creative choices of his in multiverse of madness did not mesh up with where marvel was at that moment and there was also a lot of things that tonally didn't match what we had just seen in wandavision which again that's a studio issue we know that they do not let their creatives know what's going on like across the hall at the studio so there's always going to be that disconnect there but at the same time i feel like you could have watched any of wanda's previous um you know moments in the Marvel Universe and have gotten a very different interpretation of her character. And so that's where a lot of my my issues with the film lay. Uh, I would love for him to have like an actual like true horror um, like experience in Marvel. I don't think it's this film that he's being asked to potentially direct, but I think he could do something really cool in like the monster aspect like there's we're getting Blade. We already have Werewolf by Night. We have Moon Knight. We have a lot of the more 
like superheroes that line up more closely with where his creative vision lies. And I think that's something that he should do. And I would also love to see him do television. I think there's a lot that he could do with that, the structure of television. Um, so I'm not like completely writing off. I don't want him to come back to the Marvel universe, but I think that he needs things that actually are in line with where his storytelling has like its strengths. Yeah. I, I will say that as far as his directing of multiverse of madness, I, I feel like, like, I love Sam Raimi. He's one of my favorite directors. I've like his back catalog is some of some of my favorite films. Evil Dead is something that is yeah. like burned and seared into my memory and my very soul. Uh, and obviously I love his Spider-Man films. I feel like Multiverse of Madness, he wasn't allowed to go as Sam Raimi as he otherwise there was still would. plenty of eye stuff <laughs> yeah there was there was a lot of that but i feel like and people disintegrating <laughs> it was a very it was it was it was sam raimi under Pressure. marvel studios it was it was a very limited he was chained to a specific thing and it kind of to me that probably didn't help the overall film it kind of felt a little bit disjointed because of that it was like he was almost fighting against the limitations that were probably I'm, I'm totally just spitballing here but it felt like he was fighting against the chains that marvel had put on him uh because i feel like if you just let sam raimi just make whatever kind of multiverse of madness movie that he wanted to make it could have potentially been off the wall insane like and as you said a horror thing would have been great that yeah. being said as far as like Raimi returning to the Marvel Universe I agree with you I would love to see him I would love to see him back I'd like to see him in the television space because a lot of my favorite work of his is in the television space uh I loved Hercules and Xena Hercules yep. I uh not so much anymore, but uh, <laughs> still love Xena. Uh, yeah. Lucy Lawless, forever the best. She is, she is fantastic. And I love that you know she still fights with uh, Hercules fights with Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> <laughs> she is, she is a fantastic Twitter follow. She is. Uh, yes. I here's the thing: don't have him direct Avengers: Secret Wars. Do Midnight Suns and give him that. Lawless is flawless. Yes. Exactly. Voice of God. Yeah. Let, let Raimi do Midnight Suns and just let him do whatever. I think that's the way to go. Yeah. I as also as like controversially, I think Midnight Suns should be a television series versus oh, yeah. a movie, uh, which I do think is maybe the reverse of what Marvel is kind of regrouping themselves to do as they move forward. Cause I, I, I still think that they're going to pull away from television a little bit as they try to figure out what the magic sauce is for their movies going forward. But that's, I just feel like that's something that should be like a three season television show that is greenlit for three seasons from the very start so that they have time to pull in, you know, the werewolf by night plot lines, the, the moon Knight, the blade, the ghost rider, like all of these different characters that could show up in that universe, I think warrant yeah a television i'm looking at my my jack russell funko pop across my room and i'm like <laughs> i think that i think that you know they are very much seeming at least we're getting the vibe that they want to focus back on films and less on disney plus that being said they do have marvel spotlight yeah. so having rainy do stuff in there and having midnight suns maybe fall under marvel spotlight i think would be a good way to go with it because then you know those of us who want that kind of content will have it, but those who are just invested in the main MCU storyline won't necessarily have to really worry too much about yeah. what's going and on I, with that. And I still maintain that like Werewolf by Night is one of the best Marvel movies oh, yeah, I have fantastic. seen. And it's because it was not made for like a big screen thing. It was made for like made for television. It had that vibe to it and the aesthetic to it, but it was still some of the like strongest storytelling, strongest yeah. visuals, like a one cohesive, like creative vision. And I think that lends itself to like what the Midnight Suns can be just based yeah. off of those comic book runs, all of those characters that's what I want. And I also just really, really want Midnight Suns. I've been saying this now for years. <laughs> like that, that. it's it's been one of those things where like anytime that anybody brings up like, oh, what Marvel projects would you like to see? I immediately am like Midnight Suns. Yeah. Give me Midnight Suns. I love those comic runs. They are so very early 90s. And then like the more recent ones, uh, 
were just a ton of fun watching, you know, all of these heroes fighting demons in a effectively hell, Vegas. <laughs> It was a, it was a lot of fun, uh, and I, I I I know that before Multiverse of Madness came out, I was kind of hoping that that film would do some Midnight Sun setup because Doctor Strange it, and Wong are both pretty big parts of at least the modern version of that team. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I feel like they could do some setup here, kind of, but not really. Uh, but I think that that is the direction to go with Sam Raimi directing. Um, that being said, if he was announced to be directing Avengers Secret Wars, it wouldn't upset me. I would be cautiously optimistic, Yeah, I guess, because I do love him as a director and he is a very capable director. So I would be on board for it. Yeah, I do have my doubts that he will come back just because I do feel like Multiverse of Madness was a film that was very poorly received by Marvel fans that had previously been like pretty okay with even subpar Marvel content. And I, I looking back as somebody who was a noted Marvel cynic, uh, I can kind of mark multiverse of madness as the point where I saw the conversation shift. And I think just looking back from experience for how Disney in general overcorrects with backlash towards a film, I think that that has kind of maybe put like a dark mark on him that he's kind of like a a no-go for right now. That's not to say that I don't think he won't come back in the future, but I think it won't probably be for something as big as Secret Wars. Yeah, he That's like where my frustrations is. Because, like, when you look at it in the past, like, the Russo brothers were brought in to do Infinity War and Endgame because Winter Soldier and Civil War did gangbusters. And, like, Winter Soldier is still held up by most people as the best MCU film. Yeah. So, like, yes, (laughs) they had, they had, like, almost, like, passed that audition to like yeah and, and that's where like in the big boy seat Raimi hasn't passed that audition to get more and I think that even his Spider-Man movies while there's like a lot of nostalgia for them there's also a lot of like they're kind of a joke <laughs> so I don't know that's easy. where my hesitation is um I worry I, I worry that we're we're building this up as something that could happen and it just won't happen but I do think that I could see him coming back for a smaller project as like a, a test run to see if maybe that was just a fluke. Give him, give him Ghost Rider. Give him. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Sam Raimi lends himself more towards, I don't want to say the hokey characters, but like Ghost Rider is kind of hokey and there's a lot of humor that you can pull into that. Um, and play with and and maybe that's just because the ghost rider i think of is very hokey <laughs> and, i mean all of them are very hokey. but that's that's a genre element in marvel that i think lends itself to people who have very distinctive horror voices which sam has which it's funny that uh, like sam raimi is very much a horror like icon as far as yeah. the director That is a man who, if you asked him, he would tell you that he never wanted to be a horror director. He wanted to, like, he he is the most, like, the people who influenced him the most in his career were the Three Stooges. Like, he wanted to make, like, slapstick comedy. You can definitely see that. (laughs) Yeah, it comes up a lot. I mean, he he just wants to make slapstick comedy, and he just wants an excuse to beat the crap out of Bruce Campbell. Yeah, Uh, I was going to say, like, the fact that the most memorable aspect of Multiverse of Madness is the pizza papa, like... (laughs) That would be, see, to me, that would be the thing that would excite me the most about Raimi potentially directing Secret Wars, would be, that means we're going to get another pizza papa. Yeah, but okay, Bruce Campbell as Ghost Rider. I don't hate it. Right? Depending on the Ghost Rider. Right? Yeah, I don't hate it. Not the person that I would choose off the top of my head, um, but I don't hate it. And that's mostly just because I'm a lifelong Bruce Campbell fan, yeah. and I want to see him in all of the things. Uh, but, you know. Yeah. Whatever Raimi winds up directing, Bruce Campbell's going to be in some way involved, whether it's a cameo or something. So, Absolutely. 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, as all in the game did point out, uh, Marcus is McFeely. were just as important as the Russos. This is true. And that's why they, you know, <laughs> we're also taken forward. Uh, yeah. Paul Nolan, give Raimi a horror type Marvel movie. Absolutely. That is a good way to go. Uh, all in the game. Also saying werewolf by night director will likely direct midnight. Yeah, I, would, I, I would love Michael to come back for that. I think he that is, is it, if they are going to do Midnight Suns, it'll probably just be let's just let this guy have all of these characters since he's already started it, and like let's just go until he fails or until he finishes it. Yeah, I I absolutely adore him as a filmmaker. I'd honestly like only known him as a composer, and he's composed music for like some of my favorite movies and television shows. But that yeah. and I highly recommend the documentary about Werewolf by Night. Uh, probably one of the best making of a movie like documentaries I've ever seen. Uh, and it just, it made me want to see him do so many more Marvel things. Just I'll seeing the like joy and love for filmmaking from such an early age. Cause they pull out like family footage from yeah. when he was a kid and making his own films. And it just, it's such a fun watch and it just makes you want to see his career just continue to soar. <laughs> I absolutely love behind the scenes documentaries. Just it's so and it's made by his that brother. One, so it has this really like, beautiful personal like element to it. And it, I just, I thought it was one of the best filmmaking documentaries I've ever seen. Uh, also lukewarm take, but werewolf by night in color is pointless. And I don't like that it exists. <sighs> yeah. It was a smart money grab. I will give them that. But there's so much about the way red factors into that black and white yeah, film. Color is used symbolically. It's symbolically used. I mean, it's very like film, film school symbolism, but, yeah. but it's it works. still a part of it. It yeah. works. And I think that's what made that movie so fascinating. Also, I just... I just love that movie. I loved Gael in it. I loved, I'm blanking on the actress who played Elsa Bloodstone. I loved her. Like the whole thing is just so I good. And I am a werewolf girly. I am a werewolf girly. So that movie was like already going to be the thing that I was going to be obsessed with. And then it was so good too. <sighs> so good. so I, I actively hate werewolves. I know. Uh, I've got a thing for half half man, half dogs. I don't know why I just hate them. I bet uh, you that's... really, really hate that not only is he a werewolf, but his name is Jack Russell. <laughs> I've always found that hilarious. Uh, my one exception for hating werewolves is actually Werewolf by Night. So, because I've read those comics, I watched the film, had a good time with it. Uh, yeah, Mike, you do need to check out Werewolf yes. by Night. Yes, and yes, Laura cool. Donnelly, that's her name. Yeah, okay. She did a great job. Again, she, I was just excited that we got Elsa Bloodstone at all. Right. But she also did she also did a killer job. And right. I love their connection, not to be a shipper, but you know. That's that's like your your business cards should say Maggie Lovett, lead news editor, professional shipper. Yes. It is beautiful to be a professional shipper, especially when one half You love my, love. I love love. And also when one half of my favorite ship is back on screen look at that i was gonna I was, on. I was going to transition i had one teed up but you just did a better one let's talk about the punisher even more punisher we just talked about some set photos showing us John Last monday. <laughs> on monday and now we get to do it again and we talked about talk sam raimi on monday too so we're really just repeating the old wins you know what we i just i was sitting there monday and i was like that was a good episode but we could do better so this is like our our mulligan episode i guess hmm. uh but yeah so we got some more set photos and these ones actually i do not hesitate at all to call them set photos whereas the last one i was like it's kind of just a fan selfie uh this these are actually like set photos uh <laughs> uh in one we got to see uh him standing next to good old daredevil uh both of them looking like they've been having just just a fantastic night of yeah uh and then of course we got a pair of photos showing it showing him in a pretty messed up situation and here's the thing looking at these photos the one thing that jumps out to me immediately I love that they actually have him in the skull because yeah. so often in previous Punisher media, they saved the skull for like that mic drop moment 
Mm -hmm. And these set photos are kind of making me think maybe that's just what he's going to be wearing at all times. Yes. As he Which, should. if that is the MCU influence on uh, on this series, and then otherwise it's going to be maintaining the Netflix tone, I'm okay with it. I'm good with it. Yeah. How are you feeling? You I'm have feeling thoughts. so many things. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited. I knew that they were filming He's yesterday. Bursting at the seams. Yeah, I'm bursting at the seams. I knew they were going to be filming yesterday. People saw the Out of the Kitchen um, filming notices throughout New York yesterday. So I was like, do I want to go to bed like cautiously optimistic that I'm going to wake up to Punisher pictures? Because I, I, we obviously knew John Bernthal was in the city. Uh, and then, oh boy, I'm blessed. The pictures that we got were just delightful. I also like, obviously, it's so weird to talk about like set images. Um, and this has always been, you know, I've talked about it before. This has kind of always been just how Daredevil, Punisher, Defenders, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage has always been. We've always known a lot of plot details before the series actually delivers. And we're getting that again. Like there is some like obvious spoiler things happening in a lot of these pictures. We got that there is this anti-vigilante group that um, I believe is the dirty cop plot line that was previously teased with the, the previous incarnation of this story. So it looks like this is carrying on now into the newly revamped version of Born Again, which is really exciting. There is some of that in the comics. So you can kind of very clearly see where they're pulling from. There's also a couple um, actors that are in this scene that are clearly playing certain characters from the comics. And we're going to spoil those details, but you can easily find them on twitter.com. Uh, and I just think it's really exciting that we're getting these little like teases of plot details and we can slowly start to kind of piece together what may or may not be happening. There's also like just a ton of rumors going around right now from what people are claiming they're hearing and blah, 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 which I'm not buying into any of those until I see them for myself. And I think if they continue filming this week, which I believe they are, we might be getting some more pictures from some potential big spoilery things that might be happening, which I'm excited about if they're, you know, true, but it just makes me so much joy to see John Brenthal as the Punisher covered in blood again. <laughs> like, it, that's my jam. <laughs> I know that we joked in the past that we're getting so many set photos that like the entire series is just going to be completely revealed before it even comes out. Uh, we're getting there. We're getting pretty close. Yeah. Uh, but again, the same thing happened with Daredevil and Punisher yeah, in particular. Just... I wasn't as, I didn't consume as many like spoiler things for Iron Fist or the Defenders or Jessica Jones or Luke Cage, but for Daredevil and Punisher, I remember a lot of photos and like plot details people picked up on from like newspapers or ads and windows and little things like that. And I think that's, to be honest, the thing that I had the biggest disconnect with for a lot of MCU things, because there's this level of secrecy and the, this idea that you can't film on location and that you have to film in green screens because you're going to spoil everything. And then will people show up? And I think that Daredevil and the Punisher have always proven that no matter how much is spoiled ahead of time, there is an active desire to see these characters and to see these plots and see how they like play out. And so I think that's something that is keeping me super engaged is that we're getting all of this information ahead of time and everything isn't cloaked in secrecy and, you know, they're yeah. not setting up huge tarps to keep people from seeing things and they're not filming in a studio somewhere with a green screen. We're getting very practical things and I'm very excited about that. Well, and here's the thing. You might notice that we on Collider Dailies don't really talk about set images for other things. Yeah. Like it just doesn't really come up that often. But I, I like I kind of make an exception for daredevil born again stuff because it's almost like part of the like part of the engaging with this series as a fan it's almost yeah. like tradition with these series because yeah then as you point out the netflix shows there were so many leaks from those back in the day so many so much and yet did it, did anybody have any complaints no anybody watching this 
did you see those leaks and feel like it ruined those shows for you? Usually, by the time we got curious. to them, like by the time we got to those scenes, I'm like, oh my god, right? This is that, that those images that we saw. Oh my god, now yeah. we have to like hear what they're saying and like what's actually happening. I mean, I was always super zeroed in on like any of the Karen and Frank scenes that we got to see pictures of. Like, I still remember exactly where I was when I logged onto Twitter and saw that when he was pretending to be a homeless guy outside to talk to her. I remember the first time those pictures dropped, and they make me so excited so excited and i still think about that and that's i'm still waiting to have that moment again for this show so much maybe i mean like looking at the couple of people who have responded in chat maybe we are just a weird group of fans in the way that we take this in rwp i hate spoilers and avoid set photos didn't see any of the leaks last time that is totally fair yeah. i do understand that that way of approaching it um this is one of those things where maybe it's because I can't avoid leaks like that because of yeah. the nature of. I mean, there's people do. out there that I know that won't even watch trailers for movies. So, I mean, I there's definitely, I, I, I wish that I could do that. But I yeah. mean, everybody has their own kind of vibe for. I will say there is a reason why if I see, a, if I like want to see a movie, I have to see it at the earliest possible showing that I can. And it's because of the nature of what we do. Uh, Arrow said, I don't think people don't show up because set photos slash pot details slash leaks being revealed before the film slash TV series. But more so, it affects the perception of how it's received when it goes live. Yeah, that that's is really true. That is definitely a problem when it comes to this sort of thing. It wasn't anything that was like super, like a super major problem, I feel, with the previous Netflix series. Um, but I know that with other projects, it's been a problem both in like, obviously in the MCU, but also like Star Wars has had this problem. Yeah. Uh, DC had this problem. Shout a lot out of major to the projects. German Burger King that spoiled the entirety of the rise of Skywalker because of Reddit leaks. I will never forget you. <laughs> I will always be famous. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it is very, it like not just spoiling, but also it makes you think like different things are going to be true. Yeah. Like we were talking, er we were talking earlier in this episode about multiverse of madness. And that was one that I feel like, I feel like that movie gets more of a bad rap than it deserves because of audience expectations based on leaks and even the officially yeah. released stuff led people to think that it was go that we were going to get different things. Well, not to we like go back getting. to the multiverse of madness, but I mean, when you have your lead actress being like, I never worked with any of these people. These people all got like brought in via green screen, like weeks after we filmed the scene. And I think that's where a lot of the misconceptions come from as well, because there you're is. having people not actually even getting to be in the same room together. So you have actors that have entirely different perceptions of what they filmed than what is ultimately shown to audiences and that's my bigger issue with multiverse of madness because it wasn't just fan expectations but then it was also the complete yeah. lack of really knowing what was happening for the cast i will say there there are some times where marvel's like secrecy oh, so is too much it's too much and like that, again this one this one didn't have an effect on it but the fact that they felt that they had to tell tom holland at the end of endgame that he was going to tony stark's wedding and not his funeral. <laughs> yeah. And again, you get completely different reactions out of actors that then kind of is. Don't flow as naturally yeah. as they should. Yeah. And I have to say, like, I think again, like the fact that Daredevil is not cloaked in secrecy says a lot about where things are maybe shifting for Marvel that they're they're seeing oh well this worked for the show before maybe this isn't such a bad thing this time it's so wild to like after seeing set images that were on Getty then seeing Variety and Deadline buying those images and making it their cover images for their articles which is something that we haven't really seen in other Marvel things because they never film out in public <laughs> so it's it's such a different world and I quite like that world yeah gwyneth uh is my go-to example since it's funny af yeah just her not even realizing that she was in homecoming <laughs> yeah that's just she was probably filming for infinity war nope. or something and uh they were just like hey come film this really quick scene and then next thing you know oh that scene was for a completely different movie they did that actually with um uh Chris Evans cameo in Thor, the dark world was shot while he was filming the winter soldier. And they were just like, he come here and they pulled him over to a different set 
and it just so happened that it was Thor the Dark World. Uh, that just sort of happens. That's not really an example of what we're talking about here, but it is still, it is, as you point out, it's funny AF. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then also not an example, but I just have to highlight this because this is never not hilarious to me. Uh, never forget the Emperor announcing his return to the galaxy before Rise of Skywalker was a Fortnite event. Please don't remind me of that. I have hives whenever somebody even just mentions Fortnite. Honestly, oh god, that's another episode. I'm not going to get into it. Oh, let's talk about. You know what we don't make what we my are blood going pressure to get into? rise. <laughs> you know what we are going to get into? Something that I like and doesn't X Men ninety seven episode breakdown. four. Motendo slash like life. What was the other part of it? Life death part one. Yes. Uh, yeah. So X-Men 97 episode four came out earlier today. Really quick, Maggie, give your spoiler free general thoughts, and then we are going to dive into spoilers. So hit, hit me with your non-spoiler thoughts real quick. My non-spoilery thoughts is that I love Jubilee. I love how much her character has developed so far in X-Men 97. She's already a great character in the original animated series. Uh, and I love that this episode was such a perfect follow through from a couple different episodes in season two. Uh, and I think season three or maybe it's season. Yeah, it's all season two stuff. Uh, absolutely love that there was complete uh, synergy there between uh, the two series. Made me very happy. I think that's the most I can say. I liked it. It was a really fun episode. I will say this is the most 90s episode that they've done yet. And I'm here for it. Yes. Those are my general thoughts for this episode. It is a great episode. Uh, so yeah, go watch it. If you have already watched it, or if you don't care about spoilers, we are officially getting into the spoiler part of the discussion for this episode. So I'm going to be abundantly clear. We are about to spoil the crap out of this episode. If you have not seen it, leave. <laughs> We're not kicking you out, but we are Come back going later. To We're doing spoilers. you a favor. Yes, we are yeah. doing your favor. This is a really fun episode. You don't want it spoiled by us watch the people. episode it's it's like a half an hour long watch it come back watch it twice come back watch it twice then come back and hear our thoughts and you can hit us up on social media to give us your thoughts uh but yeah so going into spoilers in three two one so the episode is sort of like a two it's like two different stories being told one that is the majority of the episode and then one that is the smaller part of the episode let's talk about the larger one first uh which is Jubilee and Sunspot getting sucked into a video game. Yes. Uh, which is a a classic plot line. Uh, something that you've seen across all sorts of different media. The episode opens up. It is Jubilee's 18th birthday. Uh, everybody's super excited, except for Magneto, because Magneto's just, he's a crotch. <laughs> Magneto's like, my parents died when I was a child. <laughs> I was like, dude. <laughs> Like, I was I was know. waiting for the direct Holocaust drop, but he didn't he didn't mention how his parents died. Uh, he was just like, yeah, something traumatic happened to me when I was a child. No. Maybe um, he's waiting to pull that card out later on. He's like, I already pulled out my parents' died card. I'm gonna hit him with the how later. The dead parents card. Gotta love that Magneto's already pulled it out four episodes in. Uh, poor Morph. Uh, <laughs> they were just trying to be funny. <laughs> but uh, that is when we got our little uh, love triangle scene for this episode because there's not a lot of the rest of the of the team in this episode. No, but there is it's romance a, on many. There is some romance, which we're going to get into. There's like this is a lot of romance in this episode, actually. There's a lot of romance in this season, period. Um, this so we get a, a actually really entertaining back and forth about coffee between <laughs> Gambit, Rogue, and Magneto, and yeah. once again Magneto just showing up and just serving all over Gambit. Magneto's uh, just like, yes, I did show up to steal your girl, and he is succeeding. He is and succeeding. be honest with you, and I'm saying this as a uh, straight white man, uh, he would he would win. Right? With me as well. He like just I'm here I'm for just it. saying, like, I think Rumi should just embrace this. I think the three of them would be great together. Uh, a you know, thruple. little thruple action. I think it works for him, you know. I don't I don't know. I just I mean, honestly that, I loved I loved Rogue's reaction to the entire thing where she was just like 
as soon as I saw there's an open seat next to her as like, I was just like, oh, <laughs> I know what's about to happen. We're going to get the awkward love triangle. And she just looks so uncomfortable the entire time. And I was living for it. I honestly, I was enough uh, to sustain me. I was sad that we didn't get more of them, but I have survived on fewer crumbs than these. Uh, so this was enough of the crumbs to last me until next week. I just, I want to know where this is going so badly. I will say, as I was watching the episode, I as soon as that scene happened, I wrote in my notes. Uh, and like that, Maggie immediately loves this episode. Yes, instantly. Yeah. It started, the entire episode started with them being their awkward little love triangle. I was so here for it. So here for it. Uh, but yeah, so Jubilee, it's her 18th birthday. She wants to go to an arcade, but uh, Magneto ain't having none of that. So instead, she winds up hanging out in her bedroom with, with Sunspot, Roberto. With Roberto uh because i keep calling him sunspot because that's who the character is and it's easier for me to remember uh but he like we haven't called him that yet so if i say sunspot i'm talking about roberto uh so they're hanging out in a room and jubilee notices that there is a suspicious well, at least it would be suspicious to any other person but it's not to jubilee uh game console with an x-men game cartridge just sitting in uh, in her room, all hooked up, and it's called a Motendo, which, as Arrow Maxwell points out, it's a Super Nintendo Sega Genesis mashup. Uh, and yeah, the game did look like the 1993 X Men video game cartridge. Uh, specifically, I believe the Genesis game. I think it's where that artwork yes. is from, or at least what it's alluding to. Uh, which was which is brilliant, fantastic little bit of uh, nerd connections there, which. Almost makes up for them missing a nerd connection later on, which we're going to get to in a second. But yeah, they get sucked into the game. And at first they're kind of like, what's going on? Like, because it feels very real. And then they realize that what's actually happening is this game is being generated off of Jubilee's memory. So they're revisiting yes. a lot of old moments, which is why it kind of lines up with some old episodes. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before the show and you pointed out, that you you're re-watching x-men now i am and this this lined up with two episodes that you just watched yes i had just seen the mojo episode where they're in the like battle royale and then i had just also watched the Geonosha episode when they're like enslaved by the people on the island so i was like wait i was just here these are my memories too uh which i think to be honest like i've told people like i don't think you need to rewatch the animated series to see x-men 97 but now that i have actually started rewatching it with these episodes i think it does actually improve your watchability of 97 because you're not either coming in completely uh, in the dark because there are a lot of like aspects of these characters that I think are, are very much obviously follow through from the original series but then you have little moments like this where it's like a perfect this this to me feels like something I could have watched in 1997 that this was yeah. playing off things from previous seasons that there's such perfect follow through there I also like also want to back up just a second and say I was dying when we got the dial up sound when they were getting pulled into the video game like so aggressively 1990s it's so us great 90, us 90s babies that almost gave me like ptsd flashbacks to having to deal with dial up internet yeah percentage. but it's so funny too because it's like there's probably people gen z that have squarely grown up in a post dial up because they're and they that, only know that sound because of old millennials like us yes talking about it yeah, like I don't want to say there's definitely still people in America that are on dial up and some rural areas. So I'm sure there are plenty of Gen Z and Gen Alpha who have experienced dial up. But I think for the majority of people who are younger than us, uh, we were there when that that occurred. We, we Get off old. my lawn. We qualify for AARP. I did actually. I got a letter from the AARP. Well, that's because you're old. Yesterday. Well, uh, like. So it was like when I saw it, I was like, holy crap, I got a letter from the ARP. I'm not that old. But then I realized it was addressed to the person who had this apartment before me. So I was like, Whew, okay, I'm not. I mean, technically speaking, I've got a couple of years. And here's a really great pitch for AARP. AARP is not just for old people. You can actually qualify for AARP earlier on. And there are certain deals that you can get by having an AARP card. I believe you have to be over 25 uh, to apply for one. 
And if you want to sign up for AARP, <laughs> use our link. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. <laughs> AARP, sponsor us. Your favorite They're a lobbying other millennials. Group. They don't really do sponsorships of YouTube shows. Uh, <laughs> they could. I mean, remember, they need to start actively I'm sure we're not congressmen so like they aren't going to be throwing us any money but we're getting there we're getting to the the age where people watching collider dailies might actually could qualify could you imagine well i mean like could you imagine if uh, a whole bunch of colliders fo collider folk ran for congress <laughs> <laughs> no but for some reason i'm i'm picturing an aarp joke for magneto right now coming from Remy. Uh, yeah. So anyways, back to the episode. That was a weird tangent. Uh, after, after a little bit of the Genosha, uh, enslavement level, they then go into a boss fight against Magneto, uh, against a digital earlier, like younger Magneto. And I will say this was simultaneously one of my favorite parts of the episode and also the most disappointing moment of the episode. Uh, because they missed a golden opportunity to make retro video game nerds like myself very happy uh, by not having Magneto show up and say, welcome to die. Ha, ha, ha. He did like he just showed up and he's just like Magneto hamming it up, but not badly translated hamming up, which just made me up. like I was like missed opportunity could have this episode. I'm going to say it's like a it's like a seven or eight for me. That would have made it a 10 just immediately that one. That one reference would have been enough for me, but they, yes. they they missed it. Come on, guys. Especially since there were some fun Easter eggs. Oh yeah. In the show. I was living for when they get they first get sucked into the video game and there's the want it poster behind them of all the different mutants, and you see Pietro and Wanda, which brought me very, very much joy. Um uh, and very days of future pasty. Yeah, it, yeah. I was really, really excited about that. I actually need them because like I need the X-Men version of Pietro and Wanda to show up to soothe so many inner childhood moments for me. <laughs> uh, Arrow says, don't say old millennial, borrow from uh, Eliza Schleiser. We're elder millennials. See, here's the thing. I don't think that I qualify as an elder millennial. I am like a middle of the road millennial, but that's, that's, that's a conversation. See, I'm right not now. technically an elder millennial, but I believe that my life experiences qualify me to be an elder millennial because I have found myself to gravitate more towards the, the aspects of elder millennial. Cause I don't feel like the latter end of millennials at all. Don't, don't take this the wrong way. I know like at I, all. Seem, I seem older than I am. It's fine. Well, no, you strike me as the kind of person who, when you were a kid, you hung out with the adult. Yes. Yeah, that's that tracks. Yep. Uh, Arrow also said, also Matrix reference with the phone booth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that was great. Uh, that's how they kind of like jumped between that level. Uh, but yeah, so we got the Magneto fight. Then it is revealed that we have, because they've been getting helped by somebody throughout throughout this episode and then there was the reveal that uh they were being helped by a beta version of jubilee and old jubilee which i didn't know that i needed in my life but i'm happy that i have it uh yeah and, and she's it was great just, she is fantastic it's just jubilee just slightly older uh with a pretty kick-ass 90s badass suit uh yeah and so they they work together and they're able to actually defeat mojo by having him come into the game and he's the quote unquote final boss uh and yeah they kick his butt like you would expect with jubilee showing up and just unleashing like the glass cannon that she is and just showing that jubilee doesn't just make sparklers guys she's actually like kind of kind of op with her abilities if she's able to let loose Absolutely. we don't really get to see her let loose and then that takes us into our second part of the episode, which is a storm focused, almost like I'm sorry. story. You're missing a very crucial part of Jubilee oh, and Roberto right. the thing, the coming out of the video forced. game. And then finally, we got them to smooch. They smooched. <laughs> they smooched. Before, here's the thing I, I expected that. Yeah, that it was the obvious they were setting time, that up. They haven't, like, to me, they haven't really given off romantic couple energy oh they They've did they totally did buddies they totally hanging did. out energy they totally maybe did. it's 
Maybe it's because I'm a guy and I'm not very good at reading situations. Maybe. But, but no, that... there is definitely their first introduction in the second episode. There's like two little moments they have. And then when at the beginning of this episode, they're hanging out in her bedroom and they talk about the video games. And he's like, this is a make or break it moment, which is clearly him being like, your what you say next about these video games like hinges my feelings towards you, which is like such a like 90s boy thing to say. Uh, yeah, no, I totally totally saw that coming <laughs> I, was I mean so again happy. like i didn't it didn't surprise me but i was and just like, like mm, i wasn't as me, here for it as i should have been like the thing that makes me so happy is re-watching x-men the animated series there's so much romance in it there's logan pining for gene there's gene and scott there's hank and his various women <laughs> that make it so much action and uh, you have uh, Rogue and Remy. There's like so many little moments of romance. And I think that there's like, we've talked about this before. A lot of the current MCU is very sexless. Like there's just no like chemistry between the people or there's no actual romance. Like the biggest romance that we've gotten was Wanda and Vision. Like there just hasn't been any like true shipping. Like even Pepper and Tony is not like a swooning, sweeping romance. It's very cut and dry, almost very clinical feeling. Yeah, it's like, and of I, course these two are getting together. Yeah, like, of course, like, yeah, sure, whatever. I guess that makes sense. Like, there just hasn't, and even, like, Captain America's romances were fairly, like, vanilla, very bland. Like, yes, of course, these characters should be together. But X-Men, the animated series, has so much, like, genuine chemistry, passion, romance, and it's made for kids, so it's all very tame, obviously, but adults can read between the lines, and I think that was my biggest fear in hearing that we were getting X-Men 97, that we weren't going to get those relationships that were such a vital, integral part of what made the animated series kind of live in our minds for so long and really shape our opinions of these characters. And so to see them coming back and being like, yes, Scott and Jean, beautiful sweeping romance. We still have Logan pining. We have this weird little love triangle. And now yes, Jubilee and Roberto are like interested in each other. And yes, they're gonna yeah. kiss. Like, I, I love it. I love that they're not afraid of it. And then, you know, as we segue into the second half of this episode, we also have like the Storm and Forge of it all still, which, which is great. I gotta say, if I was not expecting uh Jubilee Sunspot to happen, <laughs> uh I was very much caught off guard by Storm Forge. Uh I didn't like I didn't I didn't read that at all. Yeah, uh, I mean that that was in the animated series too, and then like like the comics that's the thing yeah but even i was just like they they did not do as good a job setting this up for this season as they probably should have like if i hadn't watched any of the x-men the anime series if i hadn't read if i was just coming into this as a new viewer i would look at that and just go where the hell did that come from yeah that's again why i think it's really vital now changing my opinion on it that you should rewatch. This is that is the one thing that I'm like you have to. Otherwise, I have to agree with your earlier statement that you rewatch it as like an enrichment thing. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't need to. This is one moment where I'm like you kind of need to have that added context. Yes, it, it, it's literally his superpower yes. to be better. I was like, everybody. I would love to put Tony Stark and Forge in a room because I feel like Tony would finally feel like tiny in comparison. They would also make the most badass or the most superfluously stupid thing. Oh my god, they would, they would like together. absolute stupid technology. I, I actually need to see this now. <laughs> or they would like cure all of the world's problems in like an afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we got a little bit of throw in Hank in it. Throw Hank into the mix because he's also his super. What part of his superpower is like super in intellect? So I mean, just throw, why don't why haven't all of the geniuses in Marvel just teamed up and fixed every problem? Probably. Ego. Oh wait, that's literally a plot, and it we got Ultron from it. So maybe that's not. Maybe they should be isolated. Um. <laughs> anyways uh yeah so we got a little bit of an update on storm's whole situation we found out that forge is actually the one who made the power sapping uh wristbands and everything the the technology that ultimately took storm's powers away so she's pretty upset and runs away but then she gets brought back by uh kind of a deep cut character adversary brings her back in and uh kind of is like hey i'm here now and i'm gonna mean trouble and then that is where that episode ends 
that is where that story ends. We are going to be getting looking at the titles. We are going to be getting a uh, life debt part or life death part two on April 17th. So that'll probably be where uh, that brings up. Isn't that basically the Illuminati? Yeah, that is what happens when all the geniuses get in one room together and it didn't go well. Go uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it was a hell of a cliffhanger to leave the episode. off. I on. know. Uh, I just want Swan to get her powers back. That's all I want. I know. I love that she's getting the storyline. I think it yes. is so, 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 so compelling. I love Storm as a character so much. And I think I just want to see more of it. Because right now, like since yeah. she's lost her powers, she's been the only times we've seen her have been in these little like end Vignette. of the episode vignettes. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to the the full life death episode just because I want I want to see more of Storm properly grappling with the situation that she's in because I think it's a it's potentially a very powerful moment not only like for like just a a wonderful character moment but it's also like it could also be a wonderful uh conversation about identity mm -hmm. and like what makes a person who they are yeah um and i just want i want to see more of that so i can't wait for that episode and i'm hoping that that's going to go more into it it'll probably also play into the whole like bad guy of the week format that this show is following yes but especially since that conversation ties in with the conversation that storm and Jean were having about the baby and like her fears about raising a child that was a mutant. And there's a lot of that identity and like their connection. And there's that really great episode we got about rogue in like season two that really ties in with these themes as well about powers and, and all of that, that I think can play off quite nicely. Yeah. I also want to know what's going to happen to forge because they paid such close attention to the poison like going through his bloodstream so i want to know what's going to happen there there's so many good poison plot lines and seasons one through three so i want to see how this one plays out probably not great for him great. uh but anyways that is the end of the episode and that will be the end of our episode before we go though maggie do you have anything coming down the pipeline that you want to plug or talk about or Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sticking with us for 51 minutes. This is disgustingly long. I'm sorry. We uh, talked way too much. But you know what? A lot of you stuck with us throughout this episode. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of what I can tease for the future, I have an interview dropping tomorrow with Tom Felton that I'm in the midst of working on that I'm really excited about. It's a really fun conversation. You will see me tomorrow uh, in the driver's seat of Collider Dailies. And I will be joined by Tanya, who is the uh, lead for features, television features on the site. And I'm really excited to have her on. She'll be making her Collider debut. Uh, and then ahead of that i have my uh, junket interviews on friday for rebel moon which i am extremely excited for i have seen the movie now uh and i have all my questions ready and i'm very excited to uh talk with Zack snyder and the cast um maybe i'm one of the only people excited for it but i am very excited uh so i can't wait to share all of that in a couple of weeks because those will all be embargoed until right around when the movie comes out Gotcha. Yeah, I have lots of things. And then I have more Junkins next week and more interviews and just so much stuff. There's so much cool stuff coming. Maggie's got just so much fantastic stuff going on. The The entire team's got so much stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So much exciting stuff is coming down the pipeline. And you can check it all out on Collider.com. Jump over there. Learn you up some information. Stay informed about all your favorite entertainment topics. Uh, read some features. Check out some of our opinion stuff. We've got a fantastic features team who put in a lot of great work. And you're going to hear from one of them tomorrow. Because Tommy yes. is going to be talking. I'm excited to check out that episode because I love our features team. Uh, and I've gotten a chance to talk to Tanya a little bit here or there. Not, yes. not a ton. I, I feel like I should probably reach out and talk to her a little bit more. She's great. Uh, but I'm excited to see that episode. And I'm excited to see you in the driver's seat again. We don't yes. get enough of that. I know. And I want to I want to see more of it. Yes. Uh, so I did want to highlight. There's a really great feature that dropped last night uh, about X-Men 97 that a friend of mine wrote that is about if hot – if, if evil, why hot? And talking about uh, Maddie and Magneto and all of that. And it's a really- I read that episode. Very entertaining. Or I read that article. Uh, I, I highly recommend show. it. It's great. It was pretty great. Uh, <laughs> what percentage of Rebel Moon is in slow-mo? I guess you have to wait until the embargo lifts and check out Collider.com yeah. to find out the answer. Uh, but anyways, guys, 
be sure to tune in tomorrow for Maggie and Tanya. Uh, I will join you, I believe. Am I on Friday? I believe what, you are. What day am I on? Yes, I am on Friday, so you will see me Friday. Uh, but until then, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, uh, and we'll catch you next time.